most developed, the most famous, most infamous uh, study of IR, and that is the school of realism. And the first thing that we need to understand about realism is that it's probably the one real theory of international relations. Some would even say it's the only theory in international relations, bordering on a philosophy, more than just a theory. Now, being around for about 2,500 to 3,000 years, you kind of have some bragging rights, right? When we talk about realism in this case, it's not that problematic. It's not that debatable to say that all other theories, in some way, shape, or form, respond to realism, trying to either improve it or to negate it. So in that regard, it's probably a good idea to begin with realism in such a manner that this class really progresses on afterwards. Okay? And so we have a bunch of people that are up here. I don't know if you can really see this, right? We've got a bunch of people here that you know, contribute, probably some of the major heavy hitters, into the school of realism. Let's see if you know who any of these people are. So starting with the uh, statue of the naked Greek god. Um, up in the upper left-hand corner. Anyone want to take a jab at who you think he is? You think Aristotle. Not bad. But, 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 um, there's actually someone even before Aristotle. Who? I'll give you a hint. His his, the end of his name ends in Edis, like most Greeks do. So, Thucydides. Thucydides. As a matter of fact, Thucydides, who we will be reading, we'll be discussing him today, or we'll be reading him in depth uh, tomorrow, or discussing him in depth tomorrow, is really considered to be the father of realist philosophy. And his work, A History of the Peloponnesian War, a book that you can easily purchase in any bookstore today, is widely regarded as one of the definitive accounts not just of the civil wars between various Greek city-states in the 5th century BC, whatever it happens to be, but it's also one of the best cases in allegorical lessons for how foreign policy between states are conducted today. Okay? Next to him, I'm sure that you know this character, who does he happen to be? Machiavelli. Machiavelli. Niccolo Machiavelli. What's interesting about Machiavelli is that his name has now become an adjective. Right? When we refer to somebody as Machiavellian, or when we refer to a certain course of action as Machiavellian, what does that mean? What do you think that means? Like, what do we mean when we say, oh, this, this guy's a real Machiavellian, that was a real Machiavellian uh, strategy to do? I mean, what do we mean by that? What, do, what does that imply? What do you think? Someone who's deceitful or ruthless. Deceitful, ruthless, okay. I'm not exactly talking about the most flat right? What else? The ends justify the means. The ends justify the means. Now that's an interesting case here. The ends justify the means, which could be ruthless, could be moralistic, but if the ends don't justify the means, then what does? Okay. What else could we think of? Not bad. Not bad. Anything else we want to add to that? Yes? Pessimistic. Pessimistic. Okay. I can see that. Pessimistic to a certainly a way in which the, the world works, how reality happens to be, way in the back. Cunning. Oh, there's a nice word too. Cunning. Right? Cunning, self-interested, or better yet, the British understanding of the word clever. You know, we have in you know American English we have the word clever. The British version of clever is a little bit more sly, a little bit more like clever in the clever in American is just like uh, smart. Clever in British English is almost like well played. They're kind of a jerk, but well played type of thing. What's interesting about Machiavelli, though, is that more often than not, we know him for what reading, for what writing does Machiavelli almost always be so altogether now. The Prince, all right? In some way, shape, or form, you've read pieces of The Prince, either you know, beforehand or whatever. What's interesting about Machiavelli is that he really wasn't 
the type of person that is codified in the prince. If you really want to know his true beliefs, you have to read the Discourses of Living instead. He's much more of a proponent of democratic republicanism. And yet when he, read, when he writes the prince, he's almost writing you know, in this sarcastic, witty sense. But the neat thing about the prince is that that seems to stick with him and his persona a lot more than the more larger philosophical treaties on Republicans. OK, the one in the middle, the guy that looks like he's straight out of the Dutch Republic or Victorian England. And he happens to be, anyone know? Hobbes. Thomas Hobbes. Thomas Hobbes, who is known for, if he's known for any writing, is what? The Leviathan. We'll talk about the Leviathan later on today. What about the nice dapper guy in the military uniform over there? This one, now we're getting a little bit more complicated. Anyone know who he happens to be? Clausewitz? Very good. Karl von Clausewitz, one of the early modern military strategists of what no longer existing European states? Prussia. Prussia. Right? You all know the difference between Prussia and Russia. Right? Russia is Russia. It's eternal. And Prussia was that one part of Germany that kind of ruined it for everybody else. Right? Um, but Prussia, yes, absolutely. As a matter of fact, the Prussian military intelligentsia is single-handedly key to understanding European power politics of the 17th through late 19th century. Which means, then, that this old gentleman over here happens to be who? You know who he is? I'm sure some of you do. Otto von Bismarck, real, real cool guy. All right, we're going to talk about him in greater detail tomorrow. OK, real hard one. Who's this guy over here? <laughs> I'm bored at that. Very good. Okay. US diplomat, State Department official from the mid to early, late 20th century. Now, we're talking really about the Second World War and shortly afterwards. Morgenthau is really regarded as one of the major progenitors of what we call neoclassical realism. Neoclassical. It's really the first incantation, the first you know, version 2.0 or whatever that responds to the earlier theories of liberalism. And finally, the nice bow-tied little grandfather over here. And don't take his nice cherub-like demeanor. Uh, don't underestimate his little smile. I don't know who this gentleman is. This one's probably the most difficult. But you're going to come to know and love this guy by the end of the semester. Waltz. A man by the name of Ken Waltz who recently passed away, maybe about a year or two ago. Ken Waltz is regarded as sort of the godfather of neorealism. You know, neorealism. Ken Waltz is also one of the most profound <coughs> academics within IR studies. Being a major theorist about modern day international relations within the confines of neorealism or structural realism, Waltz has given us probably the most complex theory about how states interact to a degree that it is difficult, if not outright impossible, to disprove said theory. Some people even go so far as to say that if you can debunk Waltz's theory, I'll tell you what, if you can debunk Waltz's theory, I'll give you an A for the course. I'll just give you an A for the course if you can debunk Waltz's theory. But you've got to be careful. People have been trying to do that for the past 40 to 45 years. Right? So these are the main hitters that we're going to be looking at today and tomorrow when we study the school of realism. And so I think it's worth then beginning with, well, what are its basic premises? What are the basic premises of realism? And again, this stuff is basic 101 elementary information. If you don't know this, you might as well drop the class, right? This is basically the stuff that you pay to get into the bar to drink for the rest of the night. Okay? This is your door fee. The first thing to understand about realism, regardless of its theoretical incantation, is that the state, 
The sovereign state, the one that we were talking about last time, the Westphalian state model, is the primary actor in the international arena. Full stop. In fact, some realists would even go so far as to say that it is the only actor in the international arena. Those that are a bit more willing to compromise today say that states may not be the only, but they're still the most important. Why is that? Because states occupy the highest degree of authority. There's nothing higher than the state that manages, shapes, and regulates the international system, short of a world government, which is not going to happen. States remain the highest form of sovereign authority. <coughs> With that said, the next major thing to look at is that states operate to achieve two primary goals. Two goals, day in and day out, Monday through Sunday. Power and security, full stop. States are constantly seeking these two things, power and security, and both are interrelated. Both are symbiotic. Power increases and guarantees one's security. And security enables one to acquire and consolidate further power. So it's not really a chicken versus egg. What comes first, power or security? But it's more of a cyclical, dialectic relationship. Power gives one security, and security allows one to, at the bare bones minimum, consolidate the power that you have, and, if you're going for broke here, increase further said power. Power and security, those are the two things in states that are the primary actors. The third thing to take into account is the notion of war. War is considered to be an evil, but a necessary and an unavoidable evil. War is simply considered to be a logical and natural phenomenon in the international arena. Probably the two um, best quotes that give us this understanding between the relationship of power and security on one end and war on the other comes from two of the people that we just looked at, Clausewitz and Borenthal. Clausewitz's famous statement, war is politics by another means. It's a philosophy. In some cases, some would even regard it as a mantra. War is politics by, other, by another means. It's just simply a continuation of international relations. When diplomacy breaks down, or when a state cannot achieve what its primary objectives are before war, war is and should be considered a possible option. And what are those primary objectives? Very simple, maintaining power and maintaining security. War in this case is not meant for gain. War is not meant for adventure. War is almost always defensive in nature. Now, of course, that opens up the debate to a wide range of interpretations of what constitutes defensive war. Some would say that sometimes the best defensive war is a good preemptive offensive war. We can get to that as it comes. But the point to understand here is that war is unavoidable. It is natural, and states should not shy away from it. The second one, politics is a struggle for power over men, is Hans Morgenthau. So in that regard, war and politics are two sides of the same coin, which is ultimately a way of achieving power and security of a state. I know that I'm sounding redundant here, but I'm trying to get the point home here. I'm trying to really drive the, drive the point home, is that power and security are the two paramount issues. War is one of a number of ways in which states can achieve this. Do you want to sit somewhere? No, 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 I'm sorry. Uh, we got a phone call from 135 saying that your microphone is being uh, blasted over the speakers in their room also. <laughs> 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 do, you, do you 
mind if I check your frequency? Oh, I'm sorry. You should have interrupted. I'm giving up. I'm just people are getting a free ride here. <laughs> <laughs> really I didn't know that. Oh, no, that's perfectly fine. Okay. All right. Well, I'm just going to shout for the time being so you can all hear me, all right? Yes. Okay. You're, you're, you're good. I just needed to check. I changed theirs, but I wanted to just make sure that yours wouldn't end up being the same thing. Because this has happened twice now. Uh -huh. so, <laughs> so we think somebody's playing a practical joke by switching both of them um, to match each other so that when teachers come in the next morning, they get to hear each other talk. Um, so we're so I'm just trying to make sure make a note at the end of each day which ones are which, cause, especially because we just got that call. So thank you very much. I'm sorry to disturb. Oh no, not at all. I was wondering what you were doing. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you want to sit or something like that? No, no, it's totally, that, that's a totally legit thing. Okay. <laughs>
good Freudian slip there. Its own national interest. There's nothing stopping it. As a matter of fact, pursuing one's own national interest, self-interest, is in effect a reaction to self-preservation. If you were forced to live off the land by yourself, if you were forced to basically survive, what you do to survive is clearly in your own interest. Okay? Searching for shelter, searching for food, if need be, searching for allies. Maybe you're the lone wolf. Maybe you like to get stuff done a lot better or quicker on your own. Whatever it happens to be, that falls into states making their own decisions. The other thing we have to take into account is that these decisions are made in a field of incomplete information. That's a simple response to the notion of anarchy. And what do I mean by incomplete information? What do you think I mean when I say states operate in the field of incomplete information? What do you think that means? Uh, what probably means that uh, no state has different, uh, an incomplete understanding of what the other states uh, eventual uh, end, uh, end games or possible tactics or strategies. Okay, very good. No state has complete information on what other states are doing. Okay? You don't know what other states are doing. Even if you see, and here's the best part about it, even if you see what another state is doing, does what you see translate into what actually is? No. States could be calling bluffs. States could be, other states could be willingly putting out disinformation. The point is, is that no state operates under complete information. No one has completely eliminated the fog of war. So in that regard, we operate under a period of uncertainty. Uncertainty and hesitation. In the same way as I mentioned last week, you walk into a dark room, it's pitch black, and, you don't, and you've never seen this room before. All you can see is just black in front of you and around you. When you walk in, are you walking in quickly and with confidence, or are you feeling around with your hands to find out where the wall is? Right? Because you don't want to bump into something or fall into something or whatever it happens to be, right? So you're taking necessary precautions that you otherwise would not do if the lights were completely on. That's what a state is doing. In this case, let's just take the first three. States live in a world of anarchy. Each state pursues its own nat national interest. And states operate in a field of incomplete information drives home the point, ladies and gentlemen, that state <coughs> self-interest and preservation are not only paramount, but perennial objectives. Okay. So far, realism is not necessarily a very optimistic theory, is it? In many cases, realism is quite pessimistic. It's not depressing, but that's why we call it realism. Okay. You know how people are like, oh, are you an optimist or are you a pessimist? Or you're like, screw you, I'm a realist. Okay? <laughs> it's just, that's just how things are. That's what realism is. It may be pessimistic, to somebody who wants global peace, it may be pessimistic for someone who wants to end the vicious cycle of uncertainty, but that's why we call it realism. That's just how it is. With that said, things like treaties and alliances last as long as they are expedient. Classical realism argues that states can certainly form alliances if common interests happen to be on the table. But states will enter alliances not out of friendship, not out of philanthropy, but simply because they can get something out of this alliance. If they can't get anything, if they actually feel that their security is weakened by forming an alliance, they'll reject it. Here's the other thing about realism, though. States do this simply because that's what states do. And at the risk of sounding tongue-in-cheek, everything is, quote-unquote, strictly business. Right? Nothing is personal. If I choose to not form an alliance with you, don't take it personal. If I choose to break an alliance with you, don't take it personal. Why? I won't take it personal if you break an alliance with me. If everything is for self-preservation and self-interest, you can't be worrying about my feelings or vice versa. So according to the realist perspective then, 
Okay? What a state does or does not do has nothing to do with another state's interests, values, or morals. Only with its own. If and when war does happen, which it will, nobody wants war. But war is a natural end product. But war should be fought only for the defense of that own state. War should not be wars of liberation for other countries or other peoples. Wars should not be fought to spread an ideology <coughs> or a marketing plan. Wars are simply of defensive nature. OK, that is basically the overarching brochure for realism. Now what I want to do is spend the rest of the class time looking at the subcategories. We're going to start with classical realism, which, as I had mentioned, is more of a philosophy than anything else. Then we're going to get very briefly to neoclassical realism, and I'd like to then spend a good chunk of the end of class by talking about <coughs> neorealism. So when we talk about classical realism, and this is just mentioning Thucydides in general. We're not really pointing out anything specific in the reading. We're going to do that tomorrow. But Thucydides sort of gives us an impression of how the international system works in his writings. And the first thing that he does is that he notes that there is a quote unquote natural order of things, which is a very subjective, normative observation of the world. And there's a natural order of things between strong and weak states, no different from the laws of nature. There are strong species, there are weak species. Even with it, you want to play the social Darwin card. Okay? There are strong individuals and there are weak individuals. And each plays according to their capabilities. The strong states, almost out of necessity, have to be strong states. And why is it detrimental for a strong state not to act like a strong state? Why is it detrimental? Why do you think? Yes? Well, there's one way of looking at it. You're thinking actually more like a liberalist, but it's a good one anyway. If the strong state doesn't live up to whatever it's supposed to do, its allies, as you say, will, what did you say, like lose faith in it or look elsewhere? Okay, fair enough. But can we think even more self-interest-wise? That's not bad. I'll give you that. But can we think of something else? Can we think of more? Think more like a realist. What's wrong with a strong state not being a strong state? Because uh, the state has its own citizens in that state, so you're weakening your own strong state, and you're thereby weakening your people as well. Because they have a stake in that state. Okay. One way of looking at it is that there are people whose expectations are at stake. That's okay. People don't really come into this because we're talking domestic. We're talking domestic. Which, again, you're right. You're absolutely right. Think about it on the international scale. Uh, other states might perceive weaknesses in the state that's not doing what it's supposed to do and therefore try to undermine it. Ding, ding, ding. At the end of the day, we want to think real simplistically. A strong state has to act like a strong state. Otherwise, guess what? It risks being upended. It risks being challenged for the alpha male of the tribe. And what actually ends up happening? A this, is, this is the thing. A strong state will actually risk warfare if it does not act like a strong state. And you constantly have to defend your hegemony. You constantly have to defend your prop. Otherwise, another lion's going to come over, knock you out. And if you know how lions work, usually they go after all the cubs, because they want their own. So a strong state needs to do what a strong state does. But at the same point, a weak state needs to act like a weak state. And why is that? A weak state needs to know its place. Why? Why do weak states need to know where they are on the food chain? What do you think? I mean, do they not have the resources, probably, or the power to um, you know, conquer or fight against the big powers? So if they do tend to like, 
challenge them, then they're putting people and their own power at risk. Okay, uh, you know, on one level, you don't have the necessary capabilities to be anything other than weak. You might gamble on that, and you might win, but chances are you're gambling with money you don't have. And, then, and when you lose the match, and someone else says, pay up, and you don't have it, you're in a worse position than you are. So a weak state needs to also recognize where they are on the food chain simply because they also cannot risk instability. That doesn't mean that a weak state will be weak indefinitely. Strong and weak go, wax and wane, right? But that's for history to decide. Today's weak power could be a strong country down the road. Hard to believe, ladies and gentlemen. But about 60, 65 years ago, which Korea was slated to be the industrial giant? North. North Korea, up until roughly 1974-1975, had all the hallmarks of being one of the most developed countries in East Asia, regardless of governance. South Korea was considered to be a basket case. South Korea was poor, corrupt, squabbling, and pathetically dependent upon the United States. Where's South Korea today? Light years ahead of North Korea. Where's North Korea today? Aside from being a constant joke, um, you know, the country is an absolute, absolute mess. So again, strong and weak can come by historical circumstance, but know where you are in that time period. Prudence and common sense are just as distinct from private morality and principles of justice. What do I mean by this? When you are operating in the international arena, your morals, behaviors, ideals, and values should be different from how you govern at home. In other words, you could be the leader of an enlightened democracy. Your constitution could say democratic rights of citizens, um, free and fair elections. Oh, heck, you could be one of those annoyingly Scandinavian democracies where, like, I think the Finnish constitution has it in the constitution. The constitution of Finland actually says that it is a right of all citizens of Finland to have access to high-speed internet. <laughs> That's pretty cool if you want my opinion, okay? Now, you want to be the enlightened Republican Democrat at home? Awesome. You can't be that in the international arena. Why? Simple. You don't control the international arena. You don't control it. You have no say over the subjects or citizens of another country. And if you really want to drive the point home, the citizens and subjects of other countries don't pay taxes to you. So what? Do you care? Right? You may run on a series of morals and ideals inside your country, but that is a recipe for disaster if you apply the same type of morality and justice in the international arena. And why is that? Because what is morality? What is justice? What is justice? Better yet, are justice and morals synonymous? Or can they be completely different? Well, you didn't think we were going to get that metaphysical in this class. Right? It's a rhetorical question. But go ahead. Well, there's a saying called, well, if you don't come to democracy, democracy will come to you. Again, you're two weeks ahead of us. <laughs> but, but that also is a very good example of the dangers of morality in the international arena. You know? Oh, so your country doesn't have freedom yet? Well, we'll fly it out to you, type of thing. You know? Woe to the country that the United States looks at and says, oh, they could be using some freedom right about now. Okay? A moment of silence for Syria, you know? But you're right in that regard. Realists are going to say, dude, why? You don't owe them anything. And secondly, morality and justice work perfectly fine over there. You may not agree with it. Does, is there a justice system? Is there a, is, there a, is there a sense of law and order and justice in North Korea? No. Yes, although yeah. we may not agree with it, but it's there. 
Do I want it in my country? Hell no. Does it work there? Eh, as long as little Kim's in power, yes. Is there a sense of law and justice in China? Absolutely. Is there law and justice under the Taliban in Afghanistan? Yes, there was. Is there law and justice um, in Cuba? Of course there is. The point is, is that morality is something that unfortunately is relative. So as such, leave it at home. That doesn't necessarily mean that war is to be avoided, as I had said. War in this case should only be waged if and only if victory is guaranteed. Or on the other level, complacency compromises your own security. In other words, war should be waged for two reasons. Number one, if you know for a fact that you can win this, this is what we call the Powell Doctrine, the Colin Powell Doctrine. Overpower the enemy 10 to 1. Know that you can decisively defeat your enemy in a quick, short, and surgical war. If you can do that, okay. Because you're not fighting war for bragging rights, you're fighting a war to get your point across. The other option is if you don't go to war, if you sit there and do nothing, and the Chinese walk up your driveway. In that regard, war should be waged for defensive purposes. So, war is necessary, and it is natural, but only if you know that you can win this in five minutes, or not doing anything reduces one's security and makes the status quo even more soft than it was. <clears throat> to that, we add Machiavelli. Again, this is just general material. This is nothing in the reading specifics, but Machiavelli is known for talking about more of the human factor. Thucydides looks at this as simply the laws of the jungle. Machiavelli looks at this and says, okay, states are inorganic entities. They are run by individuals. They're run by leaders or princes to you know, drive the point home. This is where Machiavelli, this is where classical realism comes the closest to Waltz's level of analysis. Because the leaders of a state need to embody certain qualities that they otherwise would not have as ordinary citizens. Okay? Leaders need to be cunning, ruthless, but also fair. They need to abide by certain objective principles. And in this case, that means forming alliances only where necessary, not getting chummy with some countries, or being belligerent, deliberately belligerent, towards others. When you are the head of state, you have a responsibility, all the citizens, subjects, whatever it is that you want, that you represent. Either you're elected to power, or God put you there, whatever it happens to be. Okay? But as the driver of the ship, you have a certain set of responsibilities and decisions that you would otherwise not make if you were not in power. So for instance, you can say whatever you want as a private American citizen about what you would do if you were put in charge. Okay? If I were president, I would blah, 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 blah. Okay? And listen to some of the, you know, crazy nutballs talking about what they would do if they were president. I would tear up the deal with Iran. I would do this. I would do that. Yeah, you can do a lot of stuff. Your popularity, your opinion ratings are like 2%, so what the hell do you do? Right? Here's the difference. What happens when you win? What happens when you win the election? What happens when you become president? Does Obama do everything that he would personally like to do? as a private citizen. Does George W. Bush do that? Did Bill Clinton do that? No? Obama runs for office and he says, vote for me and within a week, I will close down Guantanamo Bay. Is Club Gitmo closed? No, it's still open for business. Okay? Is that because Obama lied? Or is that because, congratulations, Mr. President, you now are in charge of this country. Here's the driver's manual. Here's what you have to do. Oh, but I promise, that I, yeah, that's all nice, whatever, whatever. You know what? You're a president. You have certain decisions that you have to make. In that regard, when you are the head of state, you make decisions that are otherwise irrational 
at the domestic level, but completely rational at the international level. Which means that preemptive strikes may sometimes be necessary. Preempt, you all know what preemptive strike is, right? Go to war before you tell your opponent that you're about to go to war. What's the one, at least in theory, not in reality, but in theory, what's probably the one reason why preemptive strikes are good? What's the reason? Element of surprise. Huh? Element of surprise. Okay, what do we mean? What, what gives us an advantage in the element of surprise? You're right, but let's be specific. Um, go ahead. going to be in faith, is it? So we're, we're ready and they're not. Okay, so attack them before they get ready. Okay, anything else? Yes? Like, it's like they're prepared. There's, they have a strategy and an idea. You take the other person to surprise the person isn't ready to react back. So that gives you a leverage on how they attack. Okay, so preemptive strikes gives you at least a tactical leverage. right? You hit them before they're ready. What the idea is, is that if we can hit them before they're you know, prepared, the war could be shorter and less costly. If we wait for them to get all ready and get their troops in gear and all that kind of jazz, you know, here, here's a good example of that. What's, what's one of the best cases of, at least in theory, the merits of preemptive war? You may have heard of this if you're a military historian, the Schlieffen Plan. How many of you have heard of the Schlieffen Plan before? And what ultimately, what was the Schlieffen Plan? Anyone want to say, yes, go ahead. I think uh, Hitler sent troops. Not Hitler? Uh, um, uh, but it's Germany. Did Germany sent troops across um, Belgium, was it? Belgium? And what was Belgium at the time? Uh, a neutral state. A neutral country. And what was the ultimate intention of marching troops through Belgium? Attack northern France. To attack northern France. Okay. So do a whole bunch of quasi-legal, uh, let's be perfectly honest, completely illegal stuff for the sake of getting a tactical advantage. And let's put it this way. Who said, oh, I think it was over here, in realism, the ends justify the means. Right? Who said the ends justify the means? OK, so let's just say, in a hypothetical world, Germany did Schlieffen Plan and it won World War I. Would we really care if Germany did something illegal marching through Belgian territory? No, we would not. Why? Because who is dictating peace terms? Germany, not the United States. OK? Now, more often than not, preemptive war gets you into a lot of hot war especially today, as the United States could attest 10 plus years ago. Neighbors and alleged allies, sorry for the typo, are never to be trusted. The other thing, neighbors are never to be trusted. They can tell you what they want, but they could be feeding you misinformation. They could also be deliberately bluffing for their own self-interest. Therefore, the only state, the only people that you can trust are yourselves. No place for morality abroad, and why is that? As we just talked about before. Morals and forms of justice, they run the gamut, but they're seen as vastly, vastly different. Vastly different. Justice and strength should constantly be used at home. Power and hegemony are to be weighed abroad. So there's two types of leadership here. Domestic leadership and international leadership are the very same people in power. The last one that we look at, as far as classical realism is concerned, is Thomas Hobbes. Moving beyond just simply the philosophical, hey, I'm just going to wax lyricals on paper while I drink wine type of thing, is the far more concrete and structural English way of looking at the world. Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan, as many of you probably have read, or at least snippets of, acknowledges a couple of very pessimistic things. In fact, Hobbes is probably the most pessimistic out of all. State of nature, says Hobbes, is the state of war. Now, if realism dictates that anarchy is the state of nature, and the state of nature is war, Hobbes is basically saying, guys, gals, at any given time, war could break out because there's nothing stopping it. There's nothing stopping any other insane person in the room from just losing it at that moment. So you always have to be prepared for the inevitable. As a matter of fact, Hobbes is probably one of the biggest believers in the idea that reality is almost always dictated by the most insane person in the room. Therefore, the state 
comes into the equation. <clears throat> the state, or the Leviathan, as Hobbes refers to it, has absolutely nothing to do with democracy and justice. It is not at its inception. The state is put there for order and stability. In this case, think of the state as that tired, angry parent who has way too many kids to take care of. Some of them may not even be their own. They're on a daycare center. And I'm sure that at some point, if any of you grew up, you had brothers or sisters, and you made your mother's life a living hell. At some point or another, your mother came up with the following statement, I don't care about justice, I want quiet. Okay? That's the Leviathan. The Leviathan is there to basically tell everybody, here are the rules, shut the fuck up and sit down. <laughs> okay? That's it. Everybody, you go over there, you go over there, you go over there, and you go over there. And if any of you try to touch each other on the back seat, it touches me, it touches me, whatever it is, right? I'm going to lay down the heavy hand of the law, which is usually dead. Okay? In this case, no, I don't mean it like that. I'm not talking about slap, slap, okay? You know, good cop, bad cop, whatever it is. No one's going to call diapers, okay? Seriously. Right? But the state provides peace and order, okay? What Hobbes plays into realism is that the state, therefore, is constantly existing within a condition of defensiveness and paranoia. Okay? The state can only control order and stability over certain territories. Everything outside of its borders is historic. Therefore, knowing that in mind, since the state cannot prevent warfare, or instability outside its own borders, the state of nature is also the state of security dilemmas. Security dilemmas. Security dilemmas are a term that we're going to be looking at next week, but it's worth noting right now what a security dilemma is. Anyone heard of this term before? No? Security dilemmas are based almost entirely on perception. Almost entirely on perception. Knowing that you are living in a world of incomplete information, and knowing that states can change their strategy at moment's notice for whatever suits their interests, any activity perceived by one state against another runs the risk of being seen as belligerent and threatening to that first state. Does that, does that all make sense? In turn, the observing state, state X, sees what state Y is doing. State X interprets that as a potential threat against its security and power. Therefore, what is the natural reaction for state X to take? Build up its own power. Build up its own power. Do whatever it can to reinforce its own security. The trouble is, the minute that state X increases its own security, what does state Y do? respond in kind. And at some point, two different states with possibly two completely benign goals in mind end up becoming belligerent towards each other. So a good example of a security dilemma today is the United States' relationship with Iran. Iran declares that it's going to be moving towards nuclear power. The United States says the word nuclear should never come into the same sentence as Iran. Okay? It's just not going to happen. The Iranians could be as totally trustworthy as possible. Dude, we're not using it for weapons. It's a waste of time and energy and resources. The United States, I don't care. You guys chant death to America at least once a, once a week, and you don't like Israel. So, there it is. And suddenly the United States and Iran develop an antagonistic relationship towards each other simply because the United States does not trust Iran's intentions and Iran does not trust America's intentions.